Once again, everybody, to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. Uh, the website is offplanetradio.com. I almost forgot my own website there. Uh, <laughs> we're also on Patreon for those who wish to support us and be partakers in what goes on there, which includes um, some exclusive material, which includes the second half of this interview tonight. And uh, this ought to be a pretty good interview. We're going we're gonna to be doing a few shows here with other people in the media. Uh, basically, we burned our last two guests out. We even managed to wear Cliff High out. So uh, <laughs> we're gonna see if we can do some damage on that side of the road as well. And Emily's gonna tell you about our upcoming guest. Hey, Em, how you doing? I'm doing great, good to be back. Um, and also guys, just wanna let everybody know, we're gonna probably put some clips, a few clips out from it, but we had a really awesome group chat from our Patreon group chat this weekend that was like, really super amazing so i think we're going to put out some clips from it but yeah. come over and check that out because that's like that's actually one of the coolest parts of the patreon thing so all right let's get into it i'm actually really excited for this one so yay um <laughs> Good. okay so tonight's get tonight's guest is an accomplished musician a critical thinker and a genuinely kind and good-hearted man who we consider an ally his radio show and blog are dedicated to awakening the masses and bringing humanity back into our natural existence of living in truth and serving creation He's here to talk all things bullshit about the Beatles, the state of the alternative media, and to shoot the shit about the shape of the earth. <laughs> From Sage of Quay, Mike Williams, welcome to Off Planet Radio. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Randy, for having me on the show. It's good to have you on, brother. Um, yeah, we're going we're gonna to cover some territory tonight that includes, you know, probably the backdrop on the Paul's dead thing and uh, get into some other interesting and esoteric subjects as well. Uh, I think first, I want to focus a bit on who Mike Williams is and how he became the Sage of Quay and your own journey into this this netherland of alternative media as it is. Well, I spent 30 years plus in the corporate world. And uh, as I was making my way, you know, through my career, as I started to get to the, I would say, the last third of it. I started to become aware of become aware of the matrix, become aware of that I wasn't living my life the way I wanted to live my life. You know, you're, you're really living your life based upon some, some uh, template that's been put out there for the masses to follow. And I was on that hamster wheel like, like just about everybody else. And so it's, you know, as time went on, um, I started to poke around more and more into areas of research. And I can't even really tell you how I did that. It's, it's one of those things where something catches your interest and you start to pursue it. And as you pursue it, you, re, you know, you research more and more. And, you know, 9-11 was a big thing for me. Um, the moon landings was another big topic for me. Um, and then in, you know, in 2006, I had, um, had some personal challenges uh, that made me have to look in the mirror and say, okay, so where is this all going? And um, so, you know, I made a change in direction and that direction was that I've got to put all that stuff in the past, put it in the past and then move forward uh, with a, a new future, new beginnings. And then in 09, uh, there was a really a spiritual awakening that took place for me, and it was uh, it was very significant. And that then took me onto the the spiritual path. So the combination of 2006, where I had to make changes in my like my physical world reality, the things I was doing, coupled with three years later with the spiritual awakening brought everything together. And once I did that, there was really no looking back. My whole path in life just changed. And so I started 
Randy and Emily uh, with essentially the blog. And uh, I think the blog I started in 2011 or 2012. I'm trying to remember exactly when it was. There was two iterations of the blog. The first one, it's really the same blog, but the first one I had to, um, after a while, I had to sunset it because of um, copyright issue from uh, some of these scavenging, scavenger hunters, these law firms that go out there and try to find these uh, pictures, you know, and then they want to send you letters and tell them that you owe their client thousands of dollars. Um, yeah. So I had a situation like that and I, I was fine. I got through it fine. And, uh, but that made me change the blog because what I didn't want to have happen was for these firms to go back and start, you know, scavenging the rest of the blog and seeing what other letters they can send me. So I, I took the blog and I shut it down. I started a new one. And again, it's the same blog, but no pictures. You'll have videos, yeah. but you won't see pictures. So the um, point being is, you know, it's these trials and tribulations you're going through and you're learning as you go along. Um, so it was the blog. And then I guess it was in 2014, about four years ago, that I started up the radio shows. And I really didn't know whether I really wanted to do it or not. Uh, what had happened was I was asked to come on some other radio shows as a guest. I'm a hypnotherapist by trade. That's what I do for a living. And um, I was asked to come on and talk about hypnotherapy and to talk about past lives and stuff like that. And the guy that was uh, doing some of these interviews, Bob Charles, he knew about my blog. And I didn't know he knew about the blog, but he knew about it. And then he said to me one day, hey, Mike, you know, why don't you come on my network, which was Pyramid One, and why don't you do your own show and talk about conspiracy? And I told him, I, I don't want to do that. And he said, oh, come on, come on, it'll be great. I said, you know, Bob, I, I really don't have the time to do that. And uh, I'm not really sure how I'm going to sustain it. So long story short, he convinced me to do it. And I did a couple of live shows uh, with him back in early 2014, around that time frame. And eventually what happened was uh, he changed his format. It became a lot more new agey and that did not, fit at all with the stuff that mm -hmm. I was talking about. I mean, you're talking about New Age, and I'm talking about MK Ultra. It, it wasn't working. So I, I basically um, went off and did my own thing, and, and that's what I've been doing since uh, 2011, 2012 with the blog, and then since 2014 with the radio show. And I always give uh, a shout out to two people who got me started with the radio show, two people that came on, and when I was, nobody knew my name. It was David Icke. Oh, wow. And it was Max Egan. Oh, so nice. Max and David. Yep. I reached out to yep. uh, somebody had David Icke's email and uh, they forwarded it to me and I sent it to David and he wrote me back a couple of days later and he said, sure, mate, I'll come on your show. It was great. And, uh, and then I also reached out to Max. And at the time I was listening to Max's podcasts and I still do to this day. Yeah. Um, and uh, I sent an email to Max figuring, you know, I'll probably never hear from him, just like I thought with David, because these guys get so much uh, mail. And then Max got back to me within a couple of days and he said, sure, Mike, I'll come on your show. So David and, and Max really gave it a big, big boost, because once you have those two names mm -hmm. like that, when you approach other potential guests yeah. they and they're like, OK, yeah, well, David Icke was on and Max Egan. OK, yeah, I'll talk to this guy. So. Uh, Again, so thank you, David. Thank you, Max, for uh, helping me out. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting how it works when you're starting out. I did this. I jumped from Christian broadcasting in 2000, roughly around 2009, into what was called Exotica that became this show. And in the transition of that, I was sort of jumbling. But like you, you know, you kind of reach out to people. I got, um, I was very fortunate to get um, Bob Dean and Duncan O'Finian to come on. And Duncan, you know, hung out for years. Um, that was one of the few radio interviews that Bob Dean did in that period. And those are the things that jumpstart a podcast, a radio show. Yep. You know, and in all fairness, you were very fortunate to get David Icke because I don't even think to this day I would could have approach David Ike, I, that, that's nervous to me. 
You know, I don't, I, my experience so far, because I've been doing this with Randy now for a year and a half, more than that, almost two years, that some of the biggest people that I've gone, the ones that I thought maybe wouldn't respond, they respond right away. Yeah. Right? And then the unusual people respond right away. But it's, there's this like space in the middle where people who think that they're a bigger deal than they are, they're the ones who don't respond. You know what I mean? <laughs> so you know, some of the people I thought maybe would never respond usually got back to me within the day. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it is interesting. And that's why it's always, I mean, <laughs> me and Randy sort of jokingly and sort of not jokingly, either they were like, we shouldn't like Huey Herman on the show. <laughs> right? The interesting conversation, but he probably would get back to us. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it is, it is interesting, but yeah, it's definitely that you got a big boost from that. That's awesome that, that they, they did that. I don't listen to David Icke too much anymore, but I still do enjoy listening to Max Egan. Uh, Max Egan's awesome. I met him in yeah. Philadelphia last year, and he was uh, actually very generous and, and, and uh, expansive meeting him in person. Um, he's an interesting personality. Yeah. We've never had him on the show, but I think we will. We'd like to. This well, year. I think, you know, and I think we got to go there. We sort of, you know, we kind of have this weird agenda here where we sort of are in a flow and we kind of pull guests in as we're kind of in a discovery process, which in the background, and sometimes we'll release these videos, Emily and I'll have these brainstorming sessions where we hit on things, and that's how we kind of dovetail into guests as we go, we need to get this person on because they have an interesting perspective. And it's, and it's not a perspective we necessarily go, oh, they agree with us. They have an interesting perspective that lets us begin to expand off of a base of knowledge and that's what we want to do we want to we want a divergent interesting mix of concepts and ideas and things like that which i get the sense you do as well absolutely i don't want to be pigeonholed and um i base my show randy and emily based upon what interests me yes so if something piques my interest then i'm going to seek out a guest uh, that i think will be able to talk to that topic and that irritates some people because some people, they just want to hear a certain thing. Mm -hmm. and, yep. you know, and that's not what I do. And I try to very diplomatically explain that to folks who come to me and say, oh, I don't know why you had that person on or why you keep talking about that topic. And I'm like, look, it, it's not about you. you know? It's so many people out there that want to hear different perspectives and they are interested in this stuff. And my job as a host is to bring the best person forward that I could find that can present that material so that we get an informed discussion. So, yeah, so I'm the same way. I like to be very varied about it. I like to shake it up and uh, talk about a multitude of things. I don't want to stay on one thread because it gets really boring. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I really like listening to your show. I, I found your show a couple of years ago and um, you have some great guests on. We share some, we have had a lot of the same guests, but a lot not. Um, but even some of the same guests we've had, what, you know, I've heard what you've done with them, and then it's given me kind of other ideas of a different avenue I want to take with it. And I'm sure people do that with our show. That's, Absolutely. I mean, that's a way we should all be working together. It's not about who gets the best interview or who does it best. It's about how all of us find the most answers the quickest, you know, <laughs> you know, and, the, and the, the best, truest answers, you know what I mean, together. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I appreciate your show, and I listen quite often. Well, thank you. I listen to your guys' show, too. And uh, you're right. We listen to each other's shows, and... I'll get an idea about what the discussion was about. And then I'll have questions and ideas and say, well, you know, if I get this person on a show, I might follow up and ask the, you know, these questions. Yeah. And so it's a kind of yeah. dovetail off of each other, you know, so it's good. One of my favorite shows that I, that I ever did, um, I did with Sophia Smallstorm. And I, I had for a long time had this idea that CrossFit was a cult. But I didn't know who I would talk about it with. And then you guys did that show about Rabdo. And yes. I thought, okay, like, so, you know, so I had, I had never spoken to Sophia at this point. I contacted her at some point after that because Randy had done another show with her and someone else. So they'd been on a panel together or he'd been on her show. And I said, I'm going to do something unorthodox, which was kind of, I was nervous to do it because she's Sophia Smallstorm and I'm just me. And I was like, look, I heard your show with Mike, but I have this idea. What do you think about this? Would you be willing to look into this and do this with me? And she did. And we, like, we went so far down a rabbit hole. It was like the quintessential Sophia Smallstorm kind of podcast. And it was awesome. And, and I, you know, I was, had been looking for someone for a long time. So I was like, great, I can do that. So that's one of the ways we can really grow on each other's kinds of ideas and the things we do with each other. So 
Yeah, Sophia is one of the smartest people that I know. And she's a good friend. And I have another friend who said to me, he's also in the alternative research community. He said to me, Mike, 50% of what I know is from Sophia. <laughs> I think that most important, I mean, I don't agree with her about everything, but yeah. I like the way she's, I mostly like respect, like I, she's a huge inspiration to me in the way, um, and, and to be a radically free thinker and to just not be afraid to go down like the yeah. weirdest curve, like the weirdest part of the rabbit hole and just totally, like totally dive in. And uh, yeah. That's, yeah, she's I, a thinker, and you know you can agree to disagree with people. And that's yeah. fine. I mean, it's really a, an arena of ideas, and to be able to have civil discourse to talk about whatever, you know, and yeah. um, and that's the thing. A lot of people don't want civil discourse. They they want you to to believe what they believe. Yeah, you know? and and that's just wrong. And um, you it's know, that's also big, boring. It's it, also it, boring. It is very boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so. So that's how you got to doing the show and whatnot. What to you, like, has been the most interesting part of this? Like, is there something that before you started doing the show, because you've spoken to, at this point, hundreds of interesting people, um, is there something that you used to be sure was true that now you know is not, or something that you used to think was total bullshit that now you're like, my fucking obviously we'll get into some of that in the second hour. Like, <laughs> yeah. since here, is there something that you were totally certain was true you know what I mean? That, that like one of these guests just totally changed your mind about within one hour, maybe even. Well, I knew from my reading that MK Ultra and mind control was true. And then it's another thing when you talk to somebody like Elisa E, who's been on my show, yeah. Yeah. An an actual MK Ultra victim. And when they talk about what goes on and you're getting the personal perspective, that's very shocking. Mm -hmm. um, even though, you, you know, you may have done a lot of research and I did on MK ultra and, uh, taking a look into that when somebody steps forward and says, look, I was part of that program and they describe the abuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, you know, you, you really take a step back. So it's stuff like that, that, yeah. um, you know, it, it makes you pause and it makes you realize that you can read all you want to read and be informed about stuff. But there's nothing like talking to somebody who's actually been there. Yeah, I, at least that, in my opinion, has one of, if not the rawest MK Ultra story that I've heard. Yeah. And it's even for those of us who have some of those experiences ourselves. I like reading her books and speaking to her was a complete other level of that, um, even yeah. for me. And so, yeah, it's, it, it's a very powerful person. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's. it's um... All of my guests, I really have so much respect for all of them because they all bring expertise to the table. They are all solid researchers. Uh, whether I agree with their topic or not, I mean, it's, it's, it's irrelevant. I, I, I want to hear them out, sure. and I want them to present their topic and let the audience decide you know, where they want to go with it. Yeah. All right, well. What's the most disturbing guest you've had? The most disturbing? I don't think I've had a disturbing guest. Okay, somebody that's disturbed your worldview in a way you didn't expect, maybe. Um, gee, I, I really can't say I've had anybody that shook my world to the point where I was like, oh, my God. Um, I will say my recent guest, um, when we talked about um, Cody Snodgrass, who talked about uh, the, the black ops and um, Oklahoma, Oklahoma yeah. City. Now, I know that there are people out there that think that, you know, he's not real and he's a plant and all that stuff. Um, I don't know. I had the discussion with him and, you know, he came across to me to, to be somebody that uh, was being genuine. But what he talked about, how the, uh, how the whole process works and, you know, how it goes down and how they even go after each other poisoning each other, yep. uh, all of this. I would say, now I don't, I, I don't want to say that that like really shook me, but again, it's, it's like with Elisa. You can read all you want about that stuff, but when you start to have a conversation with somebody who's actually has done it, mm -hmm. have real life experience, uh, as an example, always having to look over your shoulder every single day. Because one of the questions I asked Cody was, did you get to the point where people you used to trust 
you realized that you couldn't trust him anymore? And his answer was, absolutely. And so what, you know, and if you take that a little further, what that means is there are people that you trust right now that you shouldn't trust. You see what I'm saying? So that, that whole bit where you're in that field of work for as long as he was in it, I don't know how you do it. And I know people are going to argue that, you know, he shouldn't be in that type of work. It's, it's bad stuff and everything else. That's beside the point. Uh, Where I'm at with it is that's what he did. And when you take a step back and think through what it is that he was involved in, it's scary stuff. Yeah, I, I feel like that about a lot of things. Like people, whether something is good, at least the point we're at right now, whether something is good or bad is irrelevant. It's happening. We need to know about it. We need to deal with it. And just like ignoring it because you don't like it or something like that is not um, any way around it. Right. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Have you, um, he was interesting. I listened to him on a couple of shows, including yours. Um, have you read the book by Wendy Painting um, about Oklahoma City? No. It's called Aberration in the Heartland of the Real, The Secret Lives of Timothy McVeigh. No, I haven't. I read uh, A Noble Lie, but I didn't read that book. Yeah. So this one, it's a huge book. Actually, I haven't, I've been trying to finish it for a long time. It's like 600 pages long. And I've been, we've been putting off having her on the show so that I can finish it because I just have very little time to read. But th- I mean, it's a, it's, it is fascinating. You know what I mean? And I'm kind of looking, uh, looking to sort of see where some of the things he said may fit in with some of the things that she said. I, this, this person, I've never seen somebody who's done so much research on a single case or a single topic. Um, she basically did her PhD. Her PhD is in the Oklahoma City bond, bond. That's yeah. what her PhD was. Um, it's a fascinating book. I recommend you check that out. Um, it's I'll definitely out. take a look. I, yeah. I have the original um, clips from that morning when uh, the emergency workers, the police, uh, the first responders were there, and there were bombs in the building that didn't detonate. Yeah. And um, so I have that, and I have it on my, uh, my alternate YouTube channel for reference uh, in case anybody wants to take a look. And it's really amazing. You can watch that footage from that morning and you can see that the story that was unfolding at the time when it happened is not the story today at all. Yeah. And that's something that people have to stop. Just like 9-11. Exactly. Just like 9-11. Exactly. And that's what people have to start getting their heads wrapped around is that they changed the story like that. And they put it out. You know, actually, Mike, that's that's a lot of what we're talking about in all of this. The real conspiracies, the scenery changes that go on in progress. And this even goes into the Paul is dead thing. Um, They change the scenery. They change the storyline. And they do it in process while we're watching. And they count on the fact that this is the goldfish effect that basically we're not going to notice, and the very subtle changes are then queued up and, and pushed out. And, you know, 9-11, it's such an interesting progression from Waco to Oklahoma City to 9-11, because there's a chain of evidence that follows through all of that, that is historical in what was happening to expose how these people were almost literally exposing themselves as they tried to cover up each significant movement they were doing. Right. Well, and because the, the media is complicit, they can cover their tracks very easily. Yeah. And because virtually everyone that's in government is corrupt, at least in positions where it counts, um, they can get away with the lies. They can continue to, to move forward. Even when they screw up big time, at some point it's going to get covered up. They're not going to investigate. They're not going to talk about it. And this is what we see all the time. It's like the game of telephone, where like you used to play when you were little. By the time it gets to the last person in the row, it's a completely different sentence than it was when it started. There's not even one word in the same. Yeah. Right. So, absolutely. Um, you see, I, I mean, it's interesting to what we're, we've gotten a lot better about being really observant in the beginning. So, like, some like this last thing with Las Vegas, they're not being able to get away with some of the shit that they've been able to get away with on the other ones because literally, the moment it starts to happen, people are recording every little thing and right. noticing every little thing and um, being more diligent about staying on some of this stuff. And it's interesting to just as we sort of 
take our, you know, assume a new position to watch how they try and adjust to the new position that we're taking on some of these things. It's, it's, I mean, it's a fascinating, how, how people can not even be interested in this stuff is sort of beyond me because if nothing else, it is quite fascinating to watch the dynamics of how this all works. Well, this is, you know, a lot of this is stuff that's been dec being decoded, you know, going back to the JFK assassination and then going forward, and that took decades to uncover, really, you know, to the point where there became something of an understanding that this truly was a conspiracy and that there was cover-up upon cover-up, multi-level. And then I actually started decoding these events with the uh, Virginia Tech shooting in 2007 through, like, the Aurora Batman shooting up to Sandy Hook. When we got to Sandy Hook, I made a conscious decision because I actually spent eight hours blogging on Sandy Hook as it was happening. And I actually identified some of the crisis actors in real time in my blog, uh, down to the point where I actually got access to the database of the photos of the company that was doing the crisis actors and found the woman who was the school teacher that was interviewed by Diane Sawyer on ABC. The crisis actors database website went down and that video was wiped. And after Sandy Hook, after exhaustively going through Sandy Hook, I made a conscious effort. I said, I'm not doing this anymore because it, it literally just, you feel, you feel depleted as yeah. a result of injecting yourself into this. Um, I guess because, because of my own background and because of my own perspective and the idea that I empathically project into all of this, by the time we got to Sandy Hook, I went, there's plenty of people out there. I emotionally couldn't do this because I felt like I was being pulled into darkness with it. Yes. Yes. I mean, you cannot, you cannot sit in that darkness and focus on it. No. 24 seven, because what will happen is you're exactly right, Randy, you will get pulled into it. You will, you know, look what happened to James Tracy. Yeah. Right? What, what, yeah. I mean, he's kind of disappeared. I haven't heard it. He was, he, his he lost his court case. He, he lost uh, the court case. He lost it. The, it was the court case about being fired from the school. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And you know, and of course, the court, the court systems are all rigged, and uh, so you know, he spent a lot of time uh, on Sandy Hook, and um, when he got fired as a tenured professor, uh, he took it to court, and uh, I mean, I read some of the, the write-ups uh, from, you know, what took place in court. And, um, you know, they essentially set him up so that he, it wasn't going to be possible that he was going to win that case. So, uh, it, you know, along the lines of what was going to be allowed, what was not going to be allowed, and all that stuff, right? This is how it works. Yeah. You know, and people have to understand this. Um, the whole system soup to nuts is corrupt. Yeah. Not to say that there aren't good people in the system, but the overall system itself, the apparatus yeah. is corrupt. Yeah, James Tracy stuff was great. And, you know, fortunately he's still alive. Dave McGowan, look what happened to Dave McGowan. You know what I mean? Dave McGowan, an even more extreme case of sort of overturning some uh, stones and then, you know, and, uh, you know, fast acting cancer, like some of our friends at uh, Bill Hicks and stuff like that, yeah. you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. In a lot of ways, McGowan was McGowan. the guy who, who pulled the sword out of the stone for, with Laurel Canyon. A lot of people had begun pulling this together. McGowan, he had the Gordian knot. He really did kind of, put together some data points. And he did this, uh, I talked to McGowan when I was working with Visigoth back in what, 2000, probably 2005, 2006. McGowan was terrified by what he had found. Yeah. Um, he was very spooked by it. And I think he always had a healthy respect, understanding that there was a darkness to this, spiritually as well as, you know, obviously, realistically, a world power aspect that did not want this coming out. <clears throat> but um, that was actually the beginning of an unraveling there in terms of the culture th where people could, I think for us, it was a dethroning of certain idols, especially people, Mike, who come from 
you know, our generation in yep. terms of the deification of the rock, rock stars and find, beginning to find out uh, these people were bloodlines, they're related to military operations. They were convening in this place, which was a mind control center. Yep. And um, that will inevitably take us into the subject of Paul McCartney, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, Dave actually, uh, he exposed uh, something that had been used for a very long time to social engineer and mind control the masses. Yeah. Like you said, Randy, yeah. people would look at these rock stars as gods and role models and so on. And the work that Dave did, uh, he just ripped the veil off. Yeah. 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 And, and he said, hey, these guys are all part of the system. Okay, whether they, I, I've been asked the question, well, you think they all were, Mike? You think they all were in the know about, uh, you know, involved in the social engineering, involved with Tavistock and the CIA and all that stuff? And I said, well, look, it works this way. Some of them, the key players were, and they, they did know. And if they weren't a key player, uh, they were being steered and managed by people, yeah. driving them in a certain direction, you know? So they were either they were e either at the head of the parade with the baton, or they were following the leader. I mean, that's they either, what it comes. Yeah, to. they were either controlling or being controlled, right? Exactly. They were either in a control spot or a spot to be controlled. It was just yeah. one or the, the yeah. list of bands out of Laurel Canyon, like Randy it's said, crazy. is unbelievable. Yeah, it's you know? it's an inter it's inter I mean, I live in Los Angeles and spent as a child. I had a friend who I used to visit her at her house all the you know do sleepovers at her house she lived right there on uh, wonderland avenue which is right across the street from lookout mountain laboratory and the place is weird i mean I, like i was like a i was a good kid i was a good student i was a gymnast whatever i was fairly uh, you know i was a little more cultured than a lot of kids but in some ways still fairly naive and incident and i got into like all my first trouble back there with them you know what I mean? Like all the first time I ever tasted liquor or smoked a joint or anything like that. It always happened there. It didn't happen in other places. You know what I mean? It just has that kind of um, energy to it. But I mean, now that once Dave McGowan ripped the lid off, I mean, there's just tons of people sort of running with what he did and looking at every genre of music and we're finding it everywhere. <laughs> like, you know, it, it wasn't just, um, when I heard him talking about that, I, um, I began to inspect my own music scene, which is a very different one than yours. And I found the, a very, a very a different version of the exact same thing. And Mark Devlin has gone and looked at his music scene and, and we've had conversations about this and it's just, there's almost no corner. There's almost no stone that they haven't, you know, <laughs> that, that you can turn over that you don't find this underneath it. Yeah, well, Mark Devlin, Devlin's a good friend of mine and, uh, and you know, Mark has done uh, amazing work in exposing the music industry and the entertainment industry. He really has. And, um, you know, so hats off to Mark. He's a good guy. He'll be on in a few weeks. He and I are doing Excellent. an event together here in Los Angeles. I think he just finished his second book too. He yeah, he, he we're doing a, um, a, a he's doing a book signing. At, uh, I put an event together here for him because he's just going to be here for a day. Okay. So book signing, and I was super honored to be part of his book and whatever. Like you know, we did. There was a chapter that he used a lot of stuff from an interview he did with me, and like I I was kind of couldn't believe it. I was yeah. like, wow, that's really cool. But, Hanging uh, with Devlin is interesting. I I got to hang out with him in Philadelphia. And uh, he's on all the time. He's not like, this isn't like what he does is a sidebar or something. He is like on this all the time. And his, you watch his mind go. Yeah. You know, and he spins things off in interesting ways. And he asks interesting questions. And he, he's constantly probing around the edges of everything. That's kind of, to me, the earmark of a great researcher. Because yeah. their, their minds are nimble. They're constantly they're constantly poking and probing the landscape. And yeah, we've shared a lot of information, Mark and I, between the two of us on the McCartney thing, because he's, you know, he has yeah. looked into that uh, considerably also, uh, as I have. Yeah, yeah. And so, he, he got some more on Paul in his new book as well, so yeah. Yeah. The cultural landscape that leads us into the Paul McCartney thing and coming out of the discussion of Laurel Canyon this is, you know, depending on how your perspective was skewed generationally, some of this may not have an emotional bearing. But I think the broader context of this is that we have all been socially engineered through everything that we love. 
predominantly music, sports, art. Uh, pick anything that goes to the emotional core and the, the aesthetic aspects of our lives. And we come to discover that it, is, it has been engineered. And that's, that's truly disturbing. You know, especially if, like you're, Mike, you're, you're an extremely good guitar player. I mean, I've watched some of your stuff and I'm like, God, I, I owe my best. I'm a sloppy guitar player. <laughs> you know, I basically was a singer who took up guitar because I wanted to be able to write. And so I never really developed the affinity with the instrument to be able to play it deep. You know, it's basically a rhythm guitarist. But in looking back on it and what influenced my life, there's... How do you explain listening to a Bob Dylan or a John Lennon, um, even a Leonard Cohen, who I know is under deep mind control, listening to the, the lyrics and the music and the resonance patterns that say, they set up? I mean, I can honestly say that there were times when the poets and the musicians saved my life and realized that a lot of this was a product of think tanks and mind control yeah it's it's a hard pill to swallow randy uh because people want their music to be organic they, yeah. they they want to believe that the music is coming from the heart and the soul of the musician now i'm not saying that there aren't musicians out there and are not writing music from their heart and soul but when these bands and these artists get to the big time it's controlled plain and simple and Music, the music industry and the entertainment industry is used as a major, major social engineering tool. And, uh, and it goes all the way back, you know, I mean, it's not just it's not just the Beatles, which was very difficult for me because I grew up as a Beatle freak. I mean, the, the Beatles were the reason why I picked up a guitar, you know. And that's why it took me a long time to, to hop into this whole McCartney thing, which we'll get into, because I guess, you know, psychologically and emotionally, I'm like, I, I don't want to go there. You know, this was my childhood. But, you know, we go back to Elvis and uh, uh, Hendrix, you know, uh, military, right? Um, Jim Morrison, you know, ties you know, into the military, his father, uh, Zappa. Uh, I mean, we just go right down the Crosby, line. Crosby, Stills, and Nash. I mean, you and know, the whole everyone. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, the, even the Eagles were part of Laurel Canyon. America, the, all of these great bands that, that were up, right. you know, in the 70s. So it, it's hard. It's hard when uh, you want it to be real and it, it touches you. And then you realize that, is it touching me because it's it's really organic? Or is it touching me because somebody has orchestrated it, manufactured it? to have that result, you know, and to, to put that vibe out there and to see how it resonates with the population. Now, I know that sounds very cynical, and some people are going to say, that sounds very cynical, Mike. But when, when you dig into it and you start to understand how much control there is, it, it, it's, you have to think that way. You have to, you have to question what's real, what comes from the heart, and what is not, what is synthetic. And when we talk about the big time music players, uh, the bands from yesteryear, the bands today, most of it is synthetic. Yeah. Most of it, yep. And the other layer to this is, you know, on one level technological, and it's also a, a, um, kind of a tweaking of perception. Uh, the Beatles is a great base to start with because you take four guys allegedly coming out of Liverpool, working class blokes, you know, guys that hard scrabbled. Uh, they're trundled off to Germany. They play bars and clubs, return back to England and sign a recording track contract with Parlophone EMI in like 62. And two years later, they're storming the world. Right and continue that cultural revolution until 1970 when they disband. They were the, the perfect storm in which to create a structure for what became pop culture and rock and roll, even as we know it now. Right. And 
I, you know, when we look at this, we don't look so closely. I mean, George Martin is a very high prof was a very high profile producer who in his lifetime was esteemed for the art of what he did. But a closer inspection forces us to look back and ask, who was George Martin? Who was he working for? And who was the corporation behind him? And when you begin to look at EMI, right. you know, you realize, oh, the technology was military. British intelligence, yeah. And then, you know, it was, it's, it's interesting because I kind, kind of collect fact datums. And I remember... Um, the Eagles producer, and I, why I can't remember his name right now, he produced Hotel California, having said that basically the, the technology that they were using in the studio was the same technology he had used as a sonar operator on ships in the Navy. So, you know, in, in a sense, modern music and the production values and the technology behind it is very much acquired from the military, and we have to expect that, oh, there's probably some things baked into that as well. Yeah, yeah. The, um, going back you know, to George Martin, and these people are all major players. Uh, Martin is, you know, was, he's passed away now, very high level Freemason. Yeah. I'm convinced uh, Brian Epstein was as well. Um, so the, the, whole, the whole system, as I mentioned before, is, is all controlled. It's controlled by uh, these secret societies. And um, again, I mean, they're using the music to steer the consciousness of, of the public, of the masses. That, that's what they're using it for. Uh, real music, independent artists like myself, um, we don't have a prayer. We have to self-publish. We have to try to you know, do what we can to get our music heard. Uh, but when you have all of this backing, all of the, the money behind promoting and uh, you know, getting bands out on tour, paying for records, recording and all that stuff, hey, you know, uh, that's done for a reason. Yes, make money is, is yeah. one thing, but it, it goes beyond just making the money. What they do is they make money while steering the consciousness, while they are conditioning the public and social engineering. So social engineering becomes a very profitable business when you do it through, through music. I, I also sometimes think that the whole money-making aspect it is like a good public cover or front for what they're really doing. Because people, anybody, I can go into the other room where my dad is watching the State of the Union on CNN and buying all of the you know, propaganda bullshit. And he'll definitely agree with me that like uh, advertising is about manipulation. Or he'd agree with me that like, yeah, they do things to make money. But, you know, so for, that will please most of the people, the sheep or whatever, right? They'll be like, oh, it's for money, right? And that acts as like the best cover for people never suspecting that it's actually really about manipulating people's minds in very particular and intricate ways. Like I say the same thing about um, like the whole thing with like uh, sports being fixed, right? Like people think it's, oh, it's about the betting and the money. No, it's not. It's about a, a, it's an, it's about a narrative that is the same kind of narrative that comes from music and all these other kinds of things. It's about there being a narrative and letting the dummies who are into the gambling, whatever, be sort of the fall guy or the front for what's really going on beyond that. Yeah, you know? that's a tough one for a lot of people to, uh, to swallow, that uh, sports, professional sports is fixed. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, Paul Romano put a video up on uh, his website, Pockets of the Future, where... Yeah, I'm I love like, it. Yeah, oh, it's good stuff. Yeah. yeah. And where, you know, this guy missed the tackle completely. Completely. You know, he looked like a total amateur out there. And, and, and Paul had said that, you know, the fix was in. This was fixed. Mm -hmm. And people went nuts. People went nuts. Hey, it was just a missed tackle. You know, what are you talking about? Not everything is a conspiracy. Not everything is controlled. But, you know... When you start getting into uh, professional sports and the amount of money and, and, and all that, you cannot just sit there and say, it's not possible. It is possible, you know? Like, I don't know, maybe the guy did miss the tackle, but in my view, it, it's food for thought. It's something that you have to register up here and keep in mind, you know, put it in your back pocket. And then as you go forward and you watch other sports, just mm -hmm. keep it in mind and see if you start to see a pattern. You know what I'm saying? 
Absolutely. I mean, we've had, we had a, a long, quite a while back now, and, and I disagree in, with some places he's gone in his work and the way he's handled it, but we had Zachary Hubbard on who does Gematria, yeah. and he can go through, through just how the codes of what the, what's being sort of fed through the sporting things. He can predict who's going to win what, what the score is going to be, how it's going to, you know what I mean, just basically by using numerology and Gematria. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's very. I look at numbers all the time on news articles. Whenever they post some kind of crisis or some kind of tragedy, the first yeah. thing I look at is the dates, the times. Yeah. I mean, it all totals to sevens, elevens, eighty-eight, thirty-three, ninety-nine. Yeah. Exactly. Have, exactly. You, have you seen? Have you seen? I know you'd have you've had him on a guest, a guest, a guest on your show to talk about flat Earth a, a way back, but sanity is in, or insanity is sanity. I mean, yeah. He has a great video. It's like 10 minutes long. It basically describes how the simulation works. You know what I mean? Where he's yep. basically saying that like the reason these numbers show up all, all, all the time is because we're obviously in a simula simulation and that's the code for the kind of event that's going to happen, basically. You know what I mean? Like that everything is, is sort of coded and that's like those kinds of codes are the sort of like the programming numbers for yeah. that kind of event. You know, okay. He did the best job. You know, me, me and a friend of mine had been uh, talking about... I our ideas of how this simulation we live in work for like a couple of weeks and put something together. And then he was able to make a 10 minute video where he just kind of summed it all up in 10 minutes. He's pretty good at, at, uh, at, at doing that, but that's a good one. People should go out there and look at that. I forget what the title of the video is, but it's about three months old and it's like a 10 minute video on sort of the simulation that we live in. Yeah. I've had him here on the show and he's a friend of mine. And uh, yeah. another great video that he did is the number 33 and yeah. he did like a 10 minute video. <laughs> Yeah. Now the number thirty three pops up in all of these 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 news articles online, you know, and it's just amazing. And and you have to ask yourself, what is going on? Are there actually people in the back room with visors and you know calculating? So put an eleven <laughs> here, you know, put a thirty three over here, or is it part of a simulation? Yeah. You know, Max Egan and I talked about this the last time Max was on the show. He says, you know, Mike, I'm, I'm starting to think that this is a simulation. Yes. So, so more and more people are starting to, you know, to ponder this. Uh, you know, if you'd ask people this maybe five years ago, they'd be like, you're crazy. What are you talking about a simulation? But more and more people now, especially people who are in the alternative research community and the truth yeah. community, they're starting to hone in on us a little bit more, you know? And people are still gonna call us crazy for thinking that way, but yeah. the patterns are there. I mean, from totally. my perspective, they're there, you know? Well, yeah. and it may be that a lot of this is encoding that was done as entrainment, how we respond to numeric sequences mm -hmm. subconsciously because they've already been laced into everything else. Yeah. And by that, you know, we're obviously in the digital generation now, and most people are very unaware of what flows in code blocks behind everything they interact with in the digital media. Right. But behind that, if you ever look at code, I and mean, I was shocked when I began to look at um, even some of Microsoft's code, how much occult stuff was embedded in what you call commented aspects of the coding. Mm -hmm. I, I like when when you look at that and you realize these coders are using some very subliminal things as well inside yes. of their, their, their software. Yes. I, wa I watched a video where there was like a, some kind of like Kabbalistic rabbi talking about gematria. And he was basically saying how you, the gematria is not so much used to decode, right? It, like the, the, the gematria is used to create the event. So those numbers will create that occurrence as opposed to you can understand the event by the numbers. It's actually used to, to sort of create, bring into physicality a certain kind of thing. Yeah, like the numbers six and eight, are, you see them all the time in these false flags. And six mm. and eight are associated from an occult black magic perspective to lure, uh, enchant, and to deceive. That's mm -hmm. why you see those numbers pop up all the time. Six, yeah. 66, 666, 888, you know, and uh, that's why when you see these events and they, they, the media puts a picture around, let's say there's a license plate, break that license plate down using gematria. Yeah. And you're going to, you know, you're going to see these numbers you, you're going to see them. They're there. You know, they're, yeah. they're showing you this stuff, you know, yeah. and every once in a while on Facebook, what I'll do is when these events happen, I will take some of the, uh, the news pictures, you know, from online websites and I will, and there are numbers there. There are license plates. There are numbers on trucks or numbers on buildings. Yeah. There's a reason why that building with that number is in that picture. Yeah. You yeah. know? Yep. And, I, I and, also, I'm just done. I also had the thought, 
and I think I may have said this before, but uh, uh, recently, like when we had all within the span of a few weeks, we had Hurricane Harvey, we had the Route One Harvest Festival massacre shooting, and then we had Har the Harvey Weinstein thing. They all yeah. happened within a few weeks of each other. Was there some kind of misfire? There was supposed to be some event related to the Harvey or Harvest or something, and just some kind of very like something went wrong in the simulation, or maybe as we start to understand the simulation, it doesn't work quite the same way, like someone becoming aware of it alters its effectiveness. Another one was um, how we had Hurricane Sandy within weeks of Sandy Hook, and the Hurricane Sandy actually moved in a hook shape. There, there were two Sandy Hooks involved with that, the one in New Jersey and yeah. the one in Connecticut. And yeah. it was Hurricane Sandy. Uh, that was an analysis that I did when I was still decoding the events, was the Sandy yeah. Hook thing. Because yeah. it literally was a hook pattern where the storm swung up off yeah. the coast and when it came back in off the coast of Connecticut, yeah. and it was a hook. And then yeah. it was also in the Batman movie. And then another, the Batman one I, movie. <laughs> another one I just realized that also happened within weeks of each other, which is over the summer. Do you remember that thing that happened at Evergreen College in Oregon where like the students basically took over and there was that professor, Brett Weinstein, who he's a really liberal guy, and they were all like accusing him basically of like being oppressive and a Nazi, all this crazy stuff, right? Yeah. His name is... Weinstein also, right? He's a, a, a Brett Weinstein. His wife's name is Heather Haying. And then the girl who got killed a few weeks later in Charlottesville, where there was a racial event, her name was Heather Hayer, right? right. Like, so it, it, it's weird the way that there's this sort of, you know, flow of those kinds of things. And I wonder if it's, you know, disruptions, uh, breakups, you know, something's going wrong in the coding pattern or, or whatever, and we're starting to be able to see it and pick up on it. Yeah, and when they use names, uh, first and last names with the same uh, first letter, Heather, mm -hmm. right? Uh, H is the number eight, and then it's 88, mm -hmm. right? So that's the number 88. And um, the numbers are important. I, I try to explain to folks that they, they paint by the numbers. It's very important mm -hmm. to understand them. And, you know, you don't have to be, a super expert in them, but at least if you get yourself familiar enough where you could pick up the patterns and you can start to understand how, you know, these things are playing out and that the numbers are very, very important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, even if you don't understand gematria and numerology, just recognizing the repetition of the numbers, that's even enough to sort of understand that there's That's what I'm fun. saying, yeah. yeah. Start there, start picking up yeah. the patterns, right? And start asking yourself, why do those numbers continue to, to appear? Yeah. Right, that's what I'm saying, yeah. It also, if you notice sometimes, like when you watch a video about a topic, the same number that was in the main number or like came up over and over in the topic will be like the length of the video. Yeah. Right, you'll get things like that, and it's like, why? <laughs> right, you'll see that on CNN or Fox News if you go on their way. It, you're like, what? <laughs> Very bizarre. Well, I also think that this is a basic encoding in the, the the reality stream that we're in. There is an encoding to it. I've noticed even the synchronicity of numbers that occur around me. I'm very aware of it, and I note sequences. I'll even note sometimes when I'm posting um, onto my our website. Uh, the the blog article number, which nobody ever sees because that's aliased in the, in the web address. But I'll see a number and I'll go, well, that's interesting given this show. And I can't give you a cited example, but it happens often enough that I'm struck by the fact that we are basically working by a numbered system here. And I think it's I think it's double-edged. I think we can, once we understand it, we can begin to decode things in a way that's meaningful and that, that meaningfulness gives us the ability to kind of turn the game around to a certain degree. Well, then we can start encoding things that are meaningful to us. Well, and we the, basically yeah. are doing yeah. that, you know? Yeah, we are. That's the key. The key is to understand it. See, the thing is, what happens is as much as we research this stuff, when we are measured up against the people that are actually putting this stuff out there, we're profane. I mean, yeah. we yeah. probably don't like to consider ourselves that, but at the end of the day, like I said, these are adepts and uh, initiates, right? And um, so Randy's absolutely right. If we get to the point where we understand this and we understand how to apply it, then what happens is we're going to be able to do things where we can change the reality. Yeah. Where we can, we can move even ourselves, not even the whole population, but you right. can 
you can actually steer yourself in a certain direction, a different direction, uh, when you start to understand more and more about this stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's... And it's, he's right. We're, already, we're, all, we're already doing it because we're three of us sitting here tonight having this conversation, having exactly. a much different life than we had 8, 10, 12 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and, and you got to bear in mind, too, a lot of these media people, when you look into their background, and this has come up consistently when we've talked to people who have come out of projects, were literally bred and educated into this system. Um, I've often wondered why so many major newscasters in the U.S. came from Canada. Canada um, some pretty well, Peter Jennings comes to mind, and a number of them. What I discovered was a lot of these people had come out of projects very focused on training in semiotics, use of language, yeah. use of symbology, projection of image. And in fact, they're adepts at that because that's a very esoteric art. It's the art of basically prophecy and communication. Well, you also have to remember that Marshall McLuhan was from Canada, right? Exactly. And Marshall yeah. McLuhan figures into this very, yeah. very heavily. Yeah. As, um, I don't think most people want to admit that. Oh, there goes another idol. But McLuhan was basically telling us then the media is the message and we are the encoders. And so in a way, he gave us a gateway to begin to decode the reality stream via media. And in that media, media that existed just before the digital era. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of these, uh, probably more than a lot, are trained in neuro linguistic programming NLP. Exactly. Um, I have a clip of uh, Sean Hannity. Uh, it's about ten minutes long, and it's a ten minute long uh, display of NLP. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Huh. I, could, I could forward it on to you. It's yeah. there's a guy that uh, he's a uh, NLP professional and uh, expert, I should say, and he broke the clip down, and he he said. He's doing this, he's doing this, he's doing this. It's about 10 minutes long. It's great. And you yeah. can see, you know, uh, Randy's right. I mean, these people are all trained in this stuff. He, these guys and these gals don't get to positions, uh, prominent positions, just because they just got lucky, you know? Right. It, these, there are positions in the media, in government, in the military. No. It's, you can work as hard as you want to work, but if you are not one of the chosen ones, if you're not earmarked, if you're not on a radar, you're not getting that job, period. That's interesting you know? to me about Hannity because he doesn't seem that particularly clever to me, but if he's tr programmed to do this or trained to do that as opposed to kind of doing it of his own, yeah, then... He, well, he, he, you know, he, again, he is specific to the target audience exactly. that he's addressing, right. yeah. which is basically your grassroots level conservative Republican... Right in the mainstream. And there's a whole level to that. You don't want to be overly intellectual, but you still want to be able to effectively use the tools. And he's very good at it. He slips stuff in. When you listen to these people, they constantly slip things in. They're not making mistakes. They're very adept at dropping subtle clues yeah. into the narrative as they're going. That's right. Exactly so, uh, you know, we're almost, gosh, we're at the end of the first hour pretty much. And we didn't talk about Paul McCartney hardly at all, <laughs> which, you know, I'm kind of good with that because I think, um, I think you've, you've really been on the record with this and you, you have done a superb job, Mike, job, Mike, of bringing the, the, the material together in your shows and with the help of um, some people who have informed your commentary, maybe just uh, point to a few things in that narrative and, and let people go out to your website and find them. Yeah, all I, all I can say is that uh, I'll start with, I was not a believer in the Paul McCartney was replaced uh, bit and, uh, or the Paul is dead. And, um, I don't even subscribe to the fact that he's dead. He could he could still be alive. I don't either, truth yeah. be told. Yeah. Yeah. And I say that, you know, Paul was replaced. Biological Paul was replaced. And they got the Paul is dead thing because the first show I did with Sophia um, dealt with the book 
the uh, the memoirs of Billy Shears, which is what I showed you guys earlier before we started the show, the book here. Yeah. 66 chapters, 666 pages, right? Of course. <laughs> of course. Of course, right? There's your encoding it, right there. In the book, it says that, you know, Paul, biological Paul died in a car crash. But um, it's, once you look at the evidence and you take a look at uh, what I did, one of the biggest things that I did that I think hit home with a lot of people was I, I created a collage of Paul McCartney over time. So I, you yes. know, I started off uh, with a picture of two of biological Paul from 1964-65. And then I, I followed it up with pictures. And it's like two or three, I think it's three slides now on this. And you can clearly, clearly see, unless you don't want to see, you want to put blinders on. If you're a clear thinking person, you can see this is not the same person. It's not. It's not yeah. the same person. Um, now, one of the things I did want to point out on the show, uh, because I think I'm the only person to really have discussed it, when we talk about the whole Paul is dead or Paul is replaced um, topic, everybody focuses on Sergeant Pepper, right? Because that was Bill Shepard or uh, William Campbell or Billy Shears, whatever you want to call him by. That was his debut album. He was brought in to the Beatles uh, to bring in the... Uh, psychedelic era. That's really what his job was. And uh, also, he essentially replaced Brian Epstein as the manager and the handler. Yeah. So once once they had uh, a manager slash handler, a director inside the band, they didn't need Brian Epstein anymore. And interestingly enough, uh, Epstein dies in August of uh, 1967. Seven. Yeah. And, you know, Pepper came out in June of 1967. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of, people can call it coincidence, but once you look at the topic in its entirety, you will see that you can call it coincidence if, coincidence if you want, but it starts to all add up. Now, what I wanted to show you guys is, this is the, this is the album that really is the one that people should a be A little focused. higher, a little higher. Can you see it? There we go, yep. Okay. It's called A Collection of Beatles Oldies. And this came out in December of 1966. I think it was released December 10th. It was actually released as an interim because the Beatles didn't hit their Christmas album that year. Is that correct? Well, right, right. So this came out, but, they, but the interesting thing is, Randy, is they call it a collection of Beatles oldies. This and they, they've only been out for a couple years. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know how you call songs like Paperback Writer, Eleanor Rigby. I'm reading the back of the, uh, the album here. Ticket to Ride, We Can Work It Out, Yellow Submarine as oldies in 1966. Yeah. Okay, so the thing is, when you look at this album cover, it, it doesn't look like a Beatles album, right? The only, the only Beatles that you see is right here in small font, small print. Yeah right? A collection of Beatles oldies. So what is this? The person well, on the front cover is Bill Shepard. Bill Shepard as Vivian Stanshall. Now, if you take a look at the way they depicted him, right? This is how Stanshall, many times you would see him back in the 60s. This is yeah. how he dressed. Yeah. Okay. So what they did with this album was they were introducing Bill Shepard to the world. Because when you look at this and you call it a Beatles album, the first question anybody should ask themselves is, well, who is that guy on the front cover? Who is that guy? You know? Yeah. That's Vivian Stanshall. That's Bill Shepard. Shepard played Stanshall. He was also Phil Ackrell of the Diplomats. And when he played with the Diplomats in the early 60s, his bandmate was Denny, Denny Lane. Lane. Right. Yep. And so when he went solo after his Beatles career, who did he call in? He called in his old friend, Denny Lane. And it's interesting, um, I, I think it was in August of last year, Denny Lane uh, did an interview with uh, another YouTube channel. I forgot the name of it. Um, sorry, guys, uh, if I should remember the name of your YouTube channel. But in that interview, Denny pretty much, he pretty much... He outed it. Outed he definitely, it. yeah. He spilled the beans. Because at the end... You know, he says, well, you know, who the hell is uh, Billy Campbell or William Campbell anyway? Um, meaning, because uh, I should set it up a little bit. 
the interviewer was asking him, what was it like to work with William Campbell, Billy Campbell, Billy Shears? And so uh, you could see during the whole conversation, Denny has kind of this tongue in cheek look on his face. And at the very end, before they cut the camera, he says, well, who the hell is Billy Campbell anyway? And what he was saying was, it's not Billy Campbell. It's, it's William Shepard. It's Billy Shepard. Billy Shears. Shears is a play on the last name of Shepard, you see. Yeah, Shears the Sheep. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to put a link up to that video. Do you, did you notice the hand gestures that were in play during the course of that interaction? Um, I can't say I focused on them, no. Did, okay, but they're there. They're very subtle. They're very subtle. It, yeah. And I think, I looked at that, I, I watched that interview a number of times, and that was, <laughs> it's very clever. It's very but see, cool. this is the game of the wink and the nod that the right. present McCartney plays as he's sort of outing himself. He's almost schizophrenic about this. Yeah. Because sometimes it appears as though he's talking about Paul McCartney as the other person. Right. And he right. does this referentially. I noticed this. I don't know if any if you've seen this book. This is um uh, Paul Dunoyer's Conversations with McCartney. Okay, I have seen the book, but I haven't read it. Yep. Okay, the, the book's interesting because there's so many inconsistencies in it. Yeah. For somebody like me who studied the Beatles, um, a good reference is Bob Spitz's book, The Beatles as well. Yep. It's a big book. It's, it's massively referenced, and the final conclusion that the book makes at the end is nobody really knows what the history of the Beatles is. Yeah, it's stunning when you read it. You read that big a book, and you get to the end, and in the footnotes, you look. They're exhaustive, and he goes, "Nobody really knows what the history of the yep. Beatles really is, including the Beatles themselves, <laughs> <laughs> including the Beatles themselves, whoever well, they may be." You know, I just, what, what's what? happened is, um, you know, Shepard has gotten to the point where um, he's, you know, he's running out of runway. He was born in 1937. He's five years older than biological Paul. Yes. That puts him at 81 years old. And um, I actually had a correspondence with Tom U. Harriet. Tom is the author of the book, uh, The Memoirs of Billy Shears. And um, basically, you know, the conversation that we had, it was through email, was that you know, William's at that point or Bill's at that point where nobody knows who William Shepard is. He wrote all of these songs, right? He was a major player in, in this, this, what some people consider to be the greatest rock and roll band of all time. And he's known as Paul McCartney, but he's not Paul McCartney. And I, it's, it's catching up with him. You know, it's, it's one of those things. Like if, if you wrote all of that music and some people say, well, maybe there were ghost writers too. That's fine. Uh, maybe there were, but. I'm also very positive that he sat down and wrote a lot of songs himself. And you wrote all those songs and you put them out there. And at the end of the day, you turn around many, many, many years later and you look back and you say, I wrote that stuff. Not this guy, Paul McCartney. So I think that that's what is actually starting to really, really bother him now. Mm. Yeah. Well, you have to assume too, given this is a Tavistock operation, there's a fair amount of mind control. This guy's been running for over 50 years. Programming breaks down, and eventually the individuated ego begins to reinsert this itself. Yeah. Anybody who goes through recovery of memories through trauma knows that at some point the self reasserts even through the filter of what are potentially multiples. And you see this in... McCartney now. I, and what's interesting to me is that he's still doing this at this age, and that he seems endlessly willing to keep extending himself out, even when he looks ridiculous doing so. But it appears as though he's still trying to establish some legacy. Yeah, I, I, he's still. I, I don't know. It, it's it's almost like like you said, Randy. He's trying to like almost validate himself when really he doesn't have to do that. Now, I have a theory, and it's just a theory, folks, but uh, Memoirs was published back on September 9th of 2009, 999. And we talked about <laughs> the numbers before. So in the book, 
Shepard says that uh, biological Paul McCartney was all about the nines. He's all about the sixes. So this September 9th, 2018 is also 999. Okay, so wow. we take the 18 at the end of 2018. One and eight yeah. is nine. So I ran this by Tom, Tom U. Harriet, and mm. wrote me back his mic. I like the way you think. Now, that doesn't mean anything's going to happen, but... 999. Also, now, I'm thinking we're close to the end of this pony ride. I think I think we're close to it also, Randy. And I also believe it's possible that if it's not on September 9th of 2018, it's possible it could be uh, November 11th of 2018 because that's triple 11s or 33. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if, if he doesn't come out and say something on November 11th, 2018, something is going to happen on 11, 11, 11, or 33. Now that, that's just my gut feeling. Like we were talking before, the numbers mean a lot to these guys. They, they paint by the numbers. And so I don't think that that particular date in November, November 11th, is going to go by without something happening. Something, yeah. Something will happen, yeah. Yeah, so, no, my, my sense is that we're close to the end of this legacy and it'll be interesting to see if the drop gets made on all this data that sits in the background and potentially even heather mills who knows may I, before before we wrap this segment up i have two things that just listening to you guys talk about this made me think about um cirque du soleil has made two two cirques that are about musicians michael jackson and the beatles i've never seen the beatles or listened to much of their music but i have seen the beatles cirque du soleil and um maybe what the, the underlying the idea here that they're trying to tell us about both Michael Jackson and the Beatles is that it was really just a circus. And also didn't Michael Jackson and Paul McCartney do something together at one time. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting yeah. that those two have Cirque du Soleil. And then the other thing is, is if you think to Shakespeare's thing, all the world's a stage and all those were, were merely actors. I see it two possible ways. Like a lot of these, like the Beatles and some of these other, even, even some of the individual celebrities, it's like, when you're in a traveling production in a play, right? And, and like, or when they the move to different cities, sometimes somebody's contract is up, they drop out, there's a new actor that comes in, plays the role, we do it for a while. So I see it like that, but also yeah. in Hollywood, in, 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 in both in Hollywood with television shows and series and in sequels of movies, and also in like Broadway and stuff, like people do certain roles when they're on their way up. They do it for a run for like a couple of years and then they move on to other roles. Yeah. What if we're in some kind of theater here, absurd theater of the absurd, and some of these people have just graduated to other roles in a larger theater in a more prestigious uh, portion of the... You know, that's we discussed <laughs> this about David Bowie and what I think right. about with David Bowie and how scripted right up to the release of Black Star and his death two days later, all numerically very significant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I look, it's all about immortality. I mean, in the end, the yeah. love you take is equal to the love you make, okay? Right. So if you go back and you listen to these songs, there's a, there's a tapestry, there's, a, there's a, things woven into them that I think are cryptically communicated messages in the time itself. Also, if you look at the various roles certain actors play, there's like a thread that runs through them. Yes, absolutely. That is very interesting. So I just often wonder, you know, the other day somebody, I haven't thought about this stuff in a while where people say, oh, this person is really this person and this person is actually this person. But the other day, somebody who was not like a conspiracy person at all to me said, did you know that Jimi Hendrix is Morgan Freeman? <laughs> that one just freaked this me out. This has been out there, you know, I, and this does get crazy. Right? Uh, honestly, at some point... <laughs> You know, we do slip off of the edge of reality with this, but yeah, uh, there's a lot of people. You know, we now live in the age where M Mike can can pull all these photos together, yeah. and and there's tons of videos. The you, the age of video and the internet made it possible for us to do the forensics yeah. that at one time we really couldn't do yeah. unless we were willing to sit down and call through newspapers and microfilm and all this other stuff. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, but remember, it's all being rewritten, too, live right. in real time. Right. Revisionist history and uh, the um, it's completely like removing certain segments of time from the timeline and all that kind of oh, stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, all of history is a lie, right? What did Napoleon say? It's his story. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's a lie agreed upon, right? Yeah. And uh, so, and, uh, and the victors write 
write the history. So it, the history doesn't mean that that's what actually happened. It, it's that's the storyline that it's a story. Yeah, the story. Yeah. It, that's all it is. You know. Yeah. All right. All right. So let's pretty much wraps up the first Very hour wraps here. Up. Yep. Oh, you, got it? you got it. Me. You. Go right. ahead. Back us up. <laughs> <laughs> that wraps up the first hour, guys. And if you'd like to join us for the second hour, where we're going to get into the state of the alternative media and uh, what, what, whatever the heck this is that we live on or in or around or something. Um, so if you'd like to uh, join us for the second hour, uh, Off Planet Media, uh, sorry, patreon.com slash Off Planet Media. See you over there. This is Off Planet Radio.